Okay, yeah, so we're going to discuss empathy, and um, I'm going to share what I've been working on and explain why I've been working on it. Also, I would like to hear your thoughts, hear about your lived experiences in relationship to some of our discussions. So I would uh, invite you to consider this an uh, interactive experience also, and I uh, want to reassure you that your voice is welcome in the conversation and also want to reassure you that difference of thought is valued. So we can, you can share, you can feel open to share here. <clears throat> in 2010, Sarah Conrass uh, completed a meta-analysis and what she found in that meta-analysis was that among Mer American college students, the average level of empathic concern, meaning people's feeling of sympathy for the misfortunes of others, declined by 48% between 1979 and 2009. If you don't know what a meta-analysis is, it's just a fancy term for it. She took a bunch of data from lots of separate uh, research studies and compiled it to gather this data and, and make sense of it. She also found that the average level of perspective taking, meaning people's tendency to imagine others' points of view, declined by 34% over the same time. Also, there was a particularly deep decline between 2000 and 2009. Okay, so first discussion question. What's empathy? And I, like, we all sort of know the term, but what is it? You know, of it. What do you think it is? Or what do you experience it as? Yeah. Uh, I experience empathy as being able to think about something from somebody else's perspective or at least attempt to do so. Mm -hmm. So Conrath, um, the person that led the study I just mentioned, she says cognitive empathy is the type of empathy in which we can think about the world, what the world is like from others' perspectives, specifically from their point of view versus our own. So for me, that was, uh, in my research, that was enlightening because I didn't really, I hadn't really thought through that and differentiated that difference. Like a lot of my, I think, empathetic, empathetic efforts were considering how I could re relate and understand what someone was saying, but it was often from my own perspective, sort of a moment of projection. And not that there's a need to split hairs, like any level of caring is caring and it's all good, but this was enlightening to me. She also talks about emotional empathy. So this form can start as emotional contagion. That just means uh, Jillian's dog dies and she's upset and she cries and I cry with her because I care about her and it just sort of, it's contagious. Or she has a really yucky experience and she's angry and I'm kind of angry with her, right? That's emotional contagion. But the more mature form extends into compassion, care, and concern for others. And so I think compassion and care can look like lots of different things. It can be lots of different things, but it's, it's sort of an action. So there's, a, there's sort of a final process in empathy that actually leads to more than caring. It leads to some action. Why does it matter? Why does empathy, empathy matter? I mean, I can't imagine any person going, ah, empathy, but, but why? Does it really matter? So it matters because it helps us personally grow. It matters because we need it for, we actually need it for survival in lots of ways. For, for, I mean, even if we didn't need it for our physical survival anymore, we need it for maybe our emotional health and survival still. Any other reasons why it matters? some big topics on my mind on a regular basis and all of them are overwhelming individually so my goal is not to overwhelm you uh, no one there's no no one person can resolve these issues it's it's going to take a lot of people and a lot of ideas uh, we have things like climate change we have things like forced migration we have things like systemic racism 
LGBTQ oppression and issues, transgender oppression and issues, poverty, this is just in America, 48 million people, just in our country, globally, you know, obviously much bigger, gender inequity. So I think about these, oops, so now what, you know, like I think about that stuff and um, I think the study uh, captured my attention and my curiosity and I wanted to spend time thinking about the idea of empathy and, and what it means to me and, and how I might respond to it as a person who likes to think about these kinds of things and potentially likes to make things in response. So I'll stop on empathy for a second and talk about Rachel Whiteread. She's an artist, a living artist, and uh, she's an artist that uh, I have been inspired by for many years. She has this quote to say, a lot of, our, of artists are very sensitive and you absorb all this information and sort of see into the future. And I like that idea. You can maybe part of our creative role is to see into the future, to speculate into the future and imagine better futures. Rachel Whiteread was the first artist to make the air around objects the subject of art. So the invisible space that surrounds things that we really don't think about because we really don't see it, she made it visible. And I put in some of her work. This is uh, the work you'll see right now. She's doing some different things right now, but for the first 20 or 30 years of her work, these are the things she's known for. So the image on your left is a fire escape, and she cast in concrete the negative space, the space where we move our bodies through to escape from a burning, burning building. So she, she physicalized invisible space. The sculpture on your right is a room. This is a library. You can see the bookshelves and you can see the indentions of the book, but it's the negative space that we're actually seeing. This is an entire house, if you can believe it. And then she also uses not only concrete, but resin. Uh, either clear or colored and so these are this image on the left is uh, those are water towers so if you've ever been to New York City there's all these water towers on top of the buildings and shows she she cast that in that resin that's the inside of a door on the right that amber colored sculpture and I find that fascinating um, as a, someone who's trained in architecture uh, the space is really important to me So I began wondering about creating an interactive experience that helps people exercise the, their capacity for empathy. And some questions that I'm asking, I wrote them up here for you. Can I physicalize and make visual an often internal, ephemeral human experience like empathy? These are the things I like to think about. Uh, how, how can I take things like ideology or sort of internal experiences and start to make some sort of external experience to them? How might an interactive installation that helps people exercise their capacity for empathy look and behave? Still don't have an answer to that, but that's what I'm thinking about. So in January of 2022, I'm going to install an installation at a group exhibition back in my hometown, Charlotte, North Carolina. Not my hometown, it's just where I live. It's not where I grew up. <laughs> um, and so uh, I've been using this five weeks to focus on one big portion of the project that needs to happen. There's lots of facets, lots of things I need to figure out to do this project that I'm trying to do, but in the five weeks that I have here, I'm focusing on what the form and the space might be. Just that big chunk. It seems like a really good starting point for me. And specifically, I'm focusing on making, uh, exploring lots of different forms and making scaled models that help me think through how I might really do this over the next six months. Uh, the, I want to talk a little bit about the process, which is why I wrote that up there like that. The, so our culture is object-oriented, and that just means we often look at the thing, and we don't really think about the process so much. It's sort of a shiny thing, gets our attention, it gets all of our energy. 
and it's what you see in the museum, it's what you see on social media. I really like the process. So, I mean, I was raised in this culture too, and I like the things as well, but it's the process that is most interesting to me. If, if you think about however many months ago I'm like, oh, empathy, oh, this study, I want to do something about that, to the final thing that I'm going to install in January, uh, that's a, like, what happens between, I can't do it because my hands are taken up, but that's, like, beginning to end. Like, all the stuff in between, that's the process. And it's, that's where, that's where, for a creative person, that's really where, where all the learning happens. It's where all the failures happen. It's where all the aha moments happen. It's where the successes start to happen. And that is what, that's where I'm learning most. So I thought, since I love the process, I would just take you for the rest of the talk through mine, how I'm doing this so far. So for the next mini slides, I'm going to kind of go through these pretty quickly. I'm just showing you how I started. So I started reading about empathy before I arrived here, started uh, looking at what other people are doing and how they're talking about it. But then when I got here, this, the, the next series of images are this what I did in the first week. So I sort of set assignments for each week because that helps me not get overwhelmed and sort of focus on tasks. So the first week I really just said focus on a bunch of iterations of form making. And I do that in lots of different ways. I, I always sketch. I typically am writing to myself. You know, it's just I think in images. I think in some words. And so I started sketching. I started thinking about this interactive installation being a wall, maybe a wall-like form. And so here I'm just sketching walls. You can see on the bottom left I start to sketch something that, that begins to have an internal space and an external space. Um, I'm definitely going to trip on that, so I'm going to put it back there. Okay. And then I also sketch in uh, software, 3D software. This is called Rhinoceros. I'll call it Rhino for short. This is software I use to, to make things digitally. Things that are, I could sketch them quickly, but when I'm in Rhino, I'm really like trying to figure out how to, how to make complicated forms, sometimes more than I can imagine. Like sometimes the software can help me extend my imagination. So here I'm making these tubular forms and I'm combining them. Here I'm making these reed-like forms and I'm combining them. Here I'm making this mesh-like form, and this really just came because I was inspired by this beautiful lamp I saw, and I <laughs> wanted just to figure out how, if I could draw it. And, uh, but then it started me thinking about so, you know, solid forms, uh, opaque forms versus very porous forms. Here I twisted the form to make it more, a little bit more chaotic and interesting to me. And then sketching still, this little shell-like thing came actually from a uh, entrance on a building that was inspiring to me and so I started playing around with that. I started drawing something in Rhino related to that. Started making a mesh form of that. And really what you should understand here is I'm just iterating. I'm just following, like I did this and then I had an idea and I did this and I had an idea or I did this and I messed up and I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting and I continued on. I'm just iterating and looking because um, I'll tell you why later. Here, I, I actually wonder if there's going to be some sort of chair-like form as part of this interactive installation, and maybe it's like a very modern, minimalist rocking chair, and maybe that's part of the interactivity. So that's actually what I'm playing around with right now. But you'll see these forms and insides and outsides and curvilinear shapes sort of show up in other ways. Here I made this form and I liked it, it was sort of morbid, it makes me sort of think of coffins and also makes me think of canoes and I liked that it was much more, the idea here in my mind's eye is this form fits much more tightly around a typical human body. Here I cut it in half, you can imagine flipping it over and laying in it, not that I would want to do that, but I can imagine that. Here I turn it into a mesh form and it's half version mesh form. Here I stand it up and I start to twist it. This is definitely going to come up in some future projects. I'm drawn to it, but it's not for this one. And sketching again, uh, starting to think about spaces in solid forms, um, cocoon-like, womb-like, those types of things. 
And then I was trying to draw spirals. And at that point, I didn't know really how to make it in the software yet. And so I was stumbling around trying to do it. And I accidentally drew this little kind of figure eight or atoms separating or atoms coming together or something in dialogue with something else. And um, I'm allowing instinct to take over, so maybe I don't have to articulate why I think it's strong all the time, which is part of my design training. You always have to explain why. But maybe in art, you don't always have to explain why. Uh, so it was it's sort of a gut response and instinct. Like, this is a strong form. I'm going to work on this. This was about my 20th thing that I drew. And that's why iteration matters, because I can't know what is compelling without looking at a whole bunch of things. I can't know what might be working and even think about it without going, oh, that really doesn't work, and this is why. So I took that two-dimensional line drawing that was a mistake, and I turned it into this kind of bulbous form in rhinoceros. And then I thought that was compelling. I thought it was worth continuing to work on it. And so the next step was to use the 3D printer here and print it, which is this little thing right here. Now, this is, a, this is an installation. This is humans can go in this space and walk around this space. This is where I'm trying to go with this, and I'll show you a lot more to explain that in a little while. But so if I want people to get in, I have to cut swaths and I have to let them in. And so that's what you see. I cut these vertical swaths in space, and then I printed it. Printing it helps me because I can look at a lot of things through analog sketching and through digital drawing and rendering, but then I need to take it into a physical form and really look at it because it's just different. You know, it's, it's just a different experience it, seeing it in a physical form. Did that, thought it was still compelling, passed whatever test I was having it pass, and the next step was, the next task I gave myself was to build a scaled model. This is a scaled model. It's just a really small scaled model. So I wanted to build a larger scaled model. If you don't know what a scaled model is, I have some images in the next few slides, slides to, ex to really explain that much more clearly. Um, but what I'd like to tell you about the first scaled model, which is actually this piece right here, was I had two rules that I gave myself. Rule one, I had to use materials and construction language that was going to relate to how I might really do it in the future. Like, this is fantastic. I'm sure I could print this as a 3D model at eight feet tall if I had $50,000, but that's not my budget for my project. So, so it has to be within my budget. It has to be realistic to what I can actually produce so wood, I can work with wood, um, and so the structure becomes wood. The other rule I gave myself is the exhibition is in a gallery, but this gallery is not super fancy, and so basically the entrance is a normal sized doorway, which is about three feet wide by about 80 inches tall. And so this has to get through those doors in some way, which means that part of the constraint is I have to assemble it and be able to assemble it and disassemble it in pieces that can fit through that space. Also, I'm going to be doing this myself. <laughs> so I have to be able to assemble it and disassemble it efficiently because it can't take a month to install an installation. I'm going to have like four days. So, you know, I have to be able to do it efficiently. Those are all great problems. I love to think about problems like that. Scale. So here's a little visual. So the model that you see right there is this model right here. It's one eighth the final size. Next model, I'll build models up to the final one to figure out how things are working. And I'll run into problems as I get more, more similar to true scale because things like gravity will really start to take hold as, as it gets bigger. So next model will be double the size of this one. This one's about one foot. So this one's going to be about two feet. And this is roughly how it relates to a normal, typical guy. 
um, guy's body. And so then the next model past that will be what's called half scale, meaning it's half the size of the final thing, which means if we're two feet here, we're going to go to four feet here. And that's kind of how it's going to relate. These are in perspective. They're a little oversized, so not quite exactly representational, but close enough. And then the final design, whether it's this design or it becomes another form in the next six months, that's where I'm going towards. So you can see how human people, human, of course human people, people <laughs> might get into the space and how much space there might be around them. You can see a level of intimacy and what I would identify as sort of cozy space, but also uh, enough space that it's not super tight like that weird canoe thing I made. So that's scale, and that's what I'm doing there. This is one eighth of where we're going. catch up with my notes here because I've just been talking off the cuff. Uh, the other thing that I think is worth sharing with you all, especially because we're in this amazing maker space, is I, a person, maybe even me, could make this by hand using typical woodworking equipment, a saw, ruler, all that kind of stuff. You could, but equipment like that and the much bigger version of that, which is called a CNC router, which it doesn't burn with a laser, it cuts with a, a little metal router blade. Uh, those machines are really helpful. They're amazing tools because they make making this so much easier on human beings now. So every single member you see here, I call the horizontals, the ribs, I call the verticals, fins, and every single one, because of this organic shape, every single one is a different geometry. There isn't one that is the same. So it's complicated and detailed, and I could do it, but I'd have to do a ton of measuring to figure it out and do it accurately, where the tools really make that process much more efficient for me, and probably more accurate than I can do without making a mistake as a person. So, okay, got the structure, it's working. I'll definitely have tons of refinement to do, but I can see how that's working and how that's going to, it is possible to scale that up and figure out the details along the way. The next challenge is the skin, so the surface on the outside. And I love the look. This is, I've had this sort of image in my mind's eye ever since I began. It's sort of translucent, it's sort of white. It is translucent, like there's definitely gonna be, I want light to emanate through a little bit. But how do I make that? And same rules apply. I have to make it in a way that I can really make it in real life. I can't afford to 3D print large panels uh, for this. So how am I going to do that? The most logical way is paneling, which is if you have this very curvilinear form here, you start to break that form down into smaller surfaces and then you start to put them together. And of course, the smaller the pieces, the more curved, it, the more clear relation it will have to this. These pieces could get very small and then it could, you know, it could look very curvilinear from two feet away. Or they could get bigger and then you start to have a more tessellated, uh, faceted experience. So lots of failures along the way. Uh, didn't really know how to do this. Have lots of refinement left to do, but it's working. I figured out that I could take those panels off the curve and lay them flat at, in the right size, and I could start to translate that curve as panels into a uh, two-dimensional surface. I mean, paper. I mean, it's not really two-dimensional, but it's mostly two-dimensional. So I could translate those panels flat and then I used my trusty friend, the, CN the um, laser cutter, to zip that out for me, which it took like two seconds. It would have taken me, you know, 30 minutes to cut it accurately. And after I cut it, I drew these lines that connect the points. And on those lines, I scored that. And so then it starts to become this. So now you can start to see it it's curving itself. Uh, there's places where it will have to, at least as... If I use big pieces of paper, it will have to break here um, or be slightly different than what you see, but 
as a two-dimensional flat surface, it has to break. Those pieces can't connect, so that's interesting. have to figure that out. And it works. Again, tons of refinements, but it's, the logic's working, and I can, I can sort that out as I figure out what it is. So things I'm thinking about for the skin at real life might be, at real scale, might be, it might be paper. It might be, it could go away from this panelized thing and it could start, it could be fabric sewn together. I can't sew that well, so that would be kind of a scary prospect to me, but maybe it could be that. Um, it could be other rigid translucent substrate that I need to research still, but the idea is working and that makes me feel good because that was, had so many things that didn't work, I was not sure I could figure that out. There's a better picture of it because there's the light coming through and it shows that quality of translucency that I'm imagining. And this is something I'm calling just a visionary rendering. It's really hard to make something if you don't have some sort of like, eh, it's kind of like this to guide where you're going, uh, especially when you're in the midst of making. There's lots of places that I describe as I'm just sort of walking down a dark hallway trying to <laughs> figure out where I'm going. So I just made this for myself and also for you to give you a sense of, it's kind of like this. Like there will be a form, it will have a skin, it will be about this size, it may or may not be this as the final form. I'm going to look at more than one at this scale. Uh, there's also going to be some technology that I'm going to use in the installation that makes it interactive. So I'll be using computer code and what are called microprocessors. They're just like baby cheap computers and sensors which you can connect to those microprocessors and those things put together are going to create the interactivity of the person in the space and lights will emanate from the outside. There will be probably some sound associated with the experience too. Kind of like this, but I don't know yet. That's it. That's my presentation. <laughs>